Well, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. I am uh, delighted to be part of this uh, meeting. I've been impressed by the presentations and the scientific content. Uh, unfortunately, I speak on a topic that is a bit depressing, and that is our role as endoscopist in uh, pancreatic cancer patients. You've seen some of these numbers before. Uh, clearly, pancreatic cancer is more common in the Western world. Uh, it's a deadly disease. In the U.S., almost everybody with pancreatic cancer will end up dying. Uh, and you can see the lines comparing the new cases with the death. And it's indeed a very depressing uh, scenario. Now, from our perspective, when we see patients with pancreatic cancer, there is usually a reason for doing the evaluation. Uh, imaging has been the, the primary mode by which we make the diagnosis. Um, as an endoscopist, uh, ERCP's role in the diagnosis is really uh, diminishing. It's more of a role in the therapeutic uh, treatment of these patients. And of course, staging, like all tumors, is very important, and imaging, especially uh, pancreatic protocol CT and MRI, are very important. And EUS over the last decade or so has become very important in diagnosing and staging uh, pancreatic cancer. Uh, so the ability of ultrasound, endoscopic ultrasound, is to kind of facilitate not only seeing the small lesions that rarely are missed by imaging, by, by the ability to obtain histologic diagnosis uh, to kind of help with the uh, management and further treatment. But it is depressing because by the time, as you've seen earlier, by the time we see patients with pancreatic cancer, the majority do not have resectable disease, and even those who have resectable disease end up the majority will be uh, dead in five years. Well, what is our role as an endoscopist? Our role is usually to manage obstruction. The most common is biliary obstruction uh, in, in lesions in the head of the pancreas. Uh, but now we're increasingly being used to help during the preoperative uh, management of these patients, especially those with locally invasive disease. And of course, in patients with uh, um, pain, which is the majority of patients with pancreatic cancer, uh, endoscopic management in the sense of pancreatic stents sometimes or EUS guided celiac block can help. We have a role in the palliative management of uh, gastric outlet obstruction, and I will touch on that. But there is a growing role, especially for EUS, in helping further, you know, other therapies like EUS guided fiducial placements that will help guide um, radiation therapy. Well, this is what we see during ERDCB, which is the double duct sign, and these patients usually have um, tumors of the head of the pancreas. Uh, the majority of these patients will obviously require a biliary uh, drainage. In some of them, there is a role for pancreatic stenting also. This is from an older slide, from older studies in the early 90s that suggested that pancreatic stent or biliary stenting is as effective as surgery, bypass surgery, in patients with unresectable uh, pancreatic cancer, which is the majority of the patients. Two issues uh, became apparent early in these studies, and these are the, 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 the problems of gastric outlet obstruction and the frequent recurrence of jaundice in these patients that we use stents to drain. And as, as you know, the standard for drainage for many years was to use plastic stents. And plastic stents are very effective in the initial drainage or biliary, of biliary obstruction. The problem with plastic stents is their size is limited by the size of the uh, operational channel in the uh, ERCP scope. And this is why you can see that the largest size we use is the, is the 12 French which is not very commonly used. The most commonly used size is the 10 French and the 7 French, and the majority of patients will have a clock stent within three to four months. And it doesn't matter how many stents you put because they all clog around the same time, so it, it doesn't add much by adding more stents. 
and the reason is the caliber of these tents limits the flow. But we know from Poiseuille law, that probably nobody remembers, is that minor changes in the size of the, uh, the cylinder, which is a stent here, will lead to significant improvement in flow, which led to the uh, advancement and the introduction of the self-expandable stents in the early 90s with some modifications since. Uh, the advantage is obviously having a small caliber introduction catheter that will later be unsheathed essentially and you will have a fully expandable stent that is with a large of uh, 10 millimeter which is much higher uh, and larger than the plastic stents used. And nowadays we have these stents available in the uh, non-covered format or partially or fully covered. And they work very well uh, when we put them in the bile duct. You can see here one with significant improvement in drainage. And early studies from Europe suggested that these have a much better uh, longevity and uh, patency uh, duration compared to patients with plastic stents. And you can see in several European studies early on in the 90s, they demonstrated that. The problem with these stents is obviously the cost. The metal stents are much more expensive, about 10 times more expensive than plastic stents. But if you consider um, the, the fact that patients do not need to come back for re-intervention, there is no need to replace the stent and hospital admissions because of cholangitis, you will notice that even with that initial cost that is very high, the overall cost is actually advantageous when you use uh, fully expandable stents. The problem is if you're gonna improve the, um, the, the patency of the stent in somebody who doesn't live more than four months, extending it before four, beyond four months is not very helpful because the patient is not gonna be alive to benefit from the financial advantage and the longer patency. And some of the early studies suggested that, in fact, uh, if you take four months as the cutoff, if, if patients live more than four months, then despite the initial significant increase in cost, financially you will be ahead putting a, uh, uh, a, a fully expandable a metal stent. And now there is several uh, meta-analyses, again, comparing the use of plastic stents with the metal stents, and they show that, you know, for patients with pancreatic cancer, it is clear nowadays that you should be really putting a, uh, an expandable stent. Unfortunately, even though the duration of the uncovered stent is much better than a plastic stent, it's clear that over time, and usually around six months, these stents will clog also. And this is what led to the development of the covered stent, partially covered and fully covered stent. And uh, the data, again, meta-analysis suggests that covered stent provide an advantage over uncovered stent in maintaining patency longer than the uncovered stent. The problem is there is a price that you pay with that and this price is usually higher migration tent rates. Around 10% of these stents will migrate out because they are fully covered and there is really nothing to anchor them. Um, and of course, there is some data suggesting, not fully confirmed, that the covered stents are also associated with more risk of pancreatitis and cholecystitis. So in most people, if there is a patent cystic duct we will avoid putting a fully covered stent in those patients, and we prefer an uncovered stent. This is a more recent um, meta-analysis suggesting that despite all of what we are concerned about with expandable stent, the use of expandable stents, either covered or uncovered, is far superior to plastic stent as far as, far as the uh, patency rate, and as far as the complications related to occlusion of the stent. So they are really, in our opinion, recommended to be used in all patients with uh, pancreatic cancer. 
And this is a more recent meta-analysis, again showing a bit more clearly that despite the early higher cost of a metal stent or fully expandable stent, the ultimate overall cost is actually much better for patients receiving the covered stent or the uncovered stent compared to plastic stent. And that's usually because of repeated admissions to the hospital and failed stents. And that is true for patients who, are, uh, who live more than three months or patients who live uh, less than three months. So the recommendation nowadays is really to move with the you know, initial placement of a covered stent compared to a plastic stent it will allow patients longer patency and less potential complications with biliary obstruction. Now there is, as you know, there is an increasing interest in neoadjuvant therapy in patients with pancreatic cancer. And there is a clearly now well-defined group that will require neoadjuvant therapy, even though in my opinion, now neoadjuvant therapy is actually expanding, and I know many institutions now use neoadjuvant therapy, even in those patients who are presumably resectable at presentation. So we're talking about this group of patients that will require stenting, and the issue early on, uh, the question was, should we use plastic stents in these patients, or should we use metal stents? And again, the data suggests that if you use plastic stent in this group of patients, the risk of complications is much higher. As you can see, the need for repeat ERCT, cholangitis, hospital admissions. While if you use self-expandable metal stents, the risk of complications is far less while they're getting their neoadjuvant therapy uh, and waiting for their surgery. And that is very true. This is a study from University of Michigan where they treated everybody was resectable or locally advanced disease with chemotherapy, neoadjuvant therapy, and looked at their experience with plastic stents or self-expandable metal stents. And as you can see, the, the advantage of uh, self-expandable metal stents is pretty obvious. So our recommendation is really for overall most patients we should be, at the beginning, putting a self-expandable metal stent in this setting. So in conclusion, for the self-expandable metal stents, <clears throat> they are much more effective than plastic stent. Uh, they have longer patency, and they do not seem to intervene with surgical resectability. They are easily, if you use short stents, they are, do not interfere with surgery. So these are the group of patients, just to summarize what I just said, there is be the group of patients who have unresectable disease. Clearly our recommendation is to proceed with self-expandable metal stents, either uncovered or covered. With those who are locally advanced or potentially resectable, who will get neoadjuvant therapy, then they should get a usually covered self-expandable metal stent. The covered ones can be removed if needed, but you can use either one because they do not interfere with surgery. But even those, as you know, self-expandable metal stent will get clogged at one point. And one of the things we used earlier is uh, to use um, a plastic stent that is introduced inside the metal stent. Uh, again, this depends on how long we're expecting the patient to live. Uh, nowadays, actually, with improved chemotherapy and patients living longer, we are using a metal stent inside a, an occluded metal stent because of the longer duration of patency. But there is some other options we have, and radiofrequency ablation is now commonly used in GI. We do it for esophageal uh, high-grade dysplasia, for example, in Barrett. But we have now biliary catheter that will allow us to introduce it via ERCT scope in uh, the biliary tree or the pancreas. And there is some data suggesting that RFA can actually improve patency of uh, stents placed if it's applied before a metal stent is placed. And recent data from the uh, the Mass General, Bibrugi and his group show that actually RFA can be used to declog an occluded metal stent uh, with actually good success rate uh, 
and longer patency. And this is another option we can use nowadays for management of patients with obstructed self-expandable stent. Well, how about pre-op uh, biliary drainage in patients who are going to for surgery, they're presumably resectable, should we drain them or not? And this has been the argument over the years uh, for most gastroenterologists, they continue to actually drain these patients. R most of these patients do, do not go, at least in the U.S., immediately to surgery. They are being staged and they get their uh, evaluation before going to surgery. And this is a summary of the pros and cons of doing preoperative um, uh, stenting or drainage. And the surgeons have been confirmed, uh, concerned about the fact that these patients tend to have more incision-related complications, infections, and that has been an issue uh, that uh, some surgeon advised us not to do preoperative drainage in these patients. And this is from the multicenter Dutch study a few years ago that was published. And you can see that actually when you complain, uh, compare the uh, patients who received uh, surgery immediately, all of these patients received surgery within a week of diagnosis, compared to those who had the stent, the red bars, you can see the complication rates in that study was much higher in the stent group, and uh, uh, the, the hospital readmission was more, uh, more common. And this kind of raised the, the issue that you really, they recommended they sh that we shouldn't do a f elective uh, pre-op drainage in these patients. The problem with this study that uh, we are concerned about is that their success rate with ERCP was actually lower than the standard acceptable success rate, which is 90%. The risk of cholangitis was very high related to you know, poor success rate or not suboptimal sex success rate. The risk of pancreatitis was clearly higher than the surgery group, and the perforation rate was uh, significantly higher than what we see usually with ERCP. So in fact, the same group decided to extend this uh, study and add a group of patients where they view self-expandable stents because they view seven French stents in the majority of their patients. And the uh, updated study they published comparing the groups with the plastic stent, groups with surgery, and groups with uh, self-expandable stent, there was a significant, actually, improvement in results when a self-expandable stent was uh, used, and they recommended that if you're gonna do preoperative drainage in patients uh, with pancreatic cancer, the use of uh, self-expandable stents is advised. What is the current recommendation? Uh, clearly, many patients with pancreatic cancer that is resectable, who can go to surgery within a week or two, and who are not severely symptomatic, uh, they should proceed to surgery without the need for endoscopic drainage. But those patients who have cholangitis, who, have, who require neoadjuvant therapy, as I mentioned earlier, where surgery is delayed, or are severely symptomatic with pruritus, then we should drain them using fully, uh, usually, uh, self-expandable metal stents, so we use the fully covered ones. Well, how about uh, abdominal pain? The majority of patients with pancreatic cancer have, uh, you know, abdominal pain, which is very difficult to manage. A small percentage of these patients have what we call a or obstructive type abdominal pain, where they have abdominal pain after PO intake. And this patients, probably these are about 10% or less of the patients. The use of a pancreatic stent may be helpful. In the other patients with more of a neoplastic infiltration, uh, uh, the, the use of a celiac axis block using EUS guidance may be helpful for the management of their pain. And this is an example of a pancreatic stent. It's preferable to put the pancreatic stent before you put an expandable biliary stent because the biliary stent may make it difficult for you to access the pancreas. How about uh, gastric outlet obstruction? Uh, pancreatic cancer is one of the most common causes uh, for uh, malignant uh, gastric outlet obstruction. And that could be in the setting of uh, either the obstruction engulfing the, the ampulla of batter, 
to be proximal or distal, uh, we see it in about 10 to 20 percent in the original study I showed you. That was one of the problems when you use um, stenting that patients came back with uh, gastric outlet obstruction that needs to be managed. And clearly, the management options are, include several options. The two main options are surgical uh, gastrojejunostomy, or now endoscopic gastrojejunostomy, uh, or replacement of stents, or rarely, obviously, doing a decompression gastrostomy. The stents, duodenal stents, are larger than the biliary stents. They've been available now for quite some time. Uh, the majority of stents available are uncovered. Some of them are covered. And the placement is technically, for the proficient endoscopist, is technically very simple. It's by, you know, advancing a wire, obviously, through the area of the obstruction. We don't need to dilate the area of obstruction. And then placing the stent above the wire and releasing it in the area of obstruction. And you can see uh, the stent there constrained by the tumor. And you can see here after it expanded, and patients uh, usually can resume PO intake pretty quickly after that. And we can do it even in patients who've had a Whipple resection. This is a classic Whipple, and you can see a stent placed for recurrent cancer. Sometimes we need to do dual stenting in patients, and clearly, if that's the case, uh, especially in these types, you need to put the biliary stent first, and then you put the duodenal stent. In this type where the, the ampulla is engulfed, sometimes we cannot find the opening into the biliary tree, so we may combine either EUS guided drainage or uh, PTC percutaneous drainage and then place the uh, duodenal stent. And the results are pretty good from a uh, success, uh, technical success is high. Uh, clinical success, patients resume PO intake uh, in the majority of patients. The problem is obviously is these stents tend to migrate sometimes. They are uh, occluded if patients live longer. So that limits their uh, use if the patient has a longer survival. And this is why in some patients, and you can see here the, the uh, comparison between surgical bypass and uh, the stenting, uh, the surgical bypass has longer duration, but it's more expensive. Um, and that's why it may be a better option in patients who are expected to live longer. And this is the Dutch study looking at the, uh, in a randomized fashion, looking at the surgical gastrojejunostomy versus stenting. And as you can see with the stents, patients resume PO intake faster, but surgery was associated with longer relief of, uh, uh, of the symptoms. Uh, endoscopy was associated with more major uh, complications and recurrence of symptoms. Uh, uh, the, there was no impact on survival, but the cost of surgery was higher compared to the cost of endoscopy. So in general, I think gastrojejunostomy is recommended for those patients who are expected to live longer than two months, while the stent is recommended for patients who are expected to have a shorter uh, life expectancy. We are now, there is a variety of endoscopic methods uh, that have been introduced that may change that approach. So there is a, a variety of endoscopic uh, EUS guided uh, gastrojejunostomy. This is one of uh, the examples where it's introduced and a, a, a short self-expandable stent, an axios uh, stent is introduced uh, and create the gastrojejunostomy. There is other methods using uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, magnets to do that. So this may play a part when it's actually more mature in the management of these patients. So in general, as I mentioned earlier, uh, surgery is the preferred option when the patients have longer survival or expected longer survival, while uh, the stents are the preferred option for patients who are high risk for surgery or expected to have short survival. Uh, just a few words about EUS 
now in endoscopic uh, management of cancer. EUS now is providing us with another way to access the biliary tree and the pancreas. In those patients, we cannot access through ERCP. So as you can see in this example, uh, EUS can access the biliary tree through the stomach into the left lobe, and we can put stents there. We can access the pancreatic duct through the stomach again if it is not accessible through the ampulla. So that's another way that will actually become more and more uh, uh, included in our management of patients with pancreatic cancers. Uh, my, my colleagues in, uh, in Baltimore have uh, reported on the use of tattoos to, to kind of tattoo where small tumors are, EUS-guided tattoos that will allow the surgeons to find the tumor and do their resections uh, more efficiently. Uh, my colleagues at Georgetown and other parts have reported also the use of fiducials, uh, EUS-guided fiducials, that will allow us to target uh, radio radiation therapy to pancreatic tumors. So in general, in conclusion, I think endoscopy plays a role. It's unfortunately mostly a palliative role in patients with pancreatic cancer. It's mainly a, a plumber's role in a sense by managing obstruction in the biliary tree in the pancreas or in the gastric uh, outlet. But I think there is an increasing role that we can combine, especially using EUS with other methods to palliate or treat pancreatic cancer. I'd like to invite you all. We have two coming meetings at, uh, in Washington and Baltimore for Hopkins. Uh, and if you are in that area, feel free to join us. Thank you very much.